Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Establishing a Successful Value-Based Care Model Through Standardization and Risk Stratification. I am Emma Goodman with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we will have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. We are pleased to have Scott Becker, publisher of Becker's Healthcare, here to moderate today's Q&A. You can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Additionally, in about a week following the webinar, we will be sending you a copy of the presentation to the email you use to register. Before we begin today's presentation, I want to thank our webinar sponsor, Change Healthcare, and introduce our wonderful presenter, Dr. Stephen Mazur. Dr. Mazur is interim, interim Chair of Orthopedic Surgery and Chief of the Hand Surgery Service for Morristown Medical Center, Atlantic Health System Flagship Hospital, and Medical Director of the Orthopedic Surgery for Atlantic Health System. Under Mazur's leadership, Atlantic Health System developed and implemented a new care coordination model for patients undergoing knee and hip replacements that ensures positive patient and quality outcomes and minimizes costs. The program is becoming a best practice for the orthopedic programs across the country, and Dr. Mazur and his team frequently lecture about Atlantic Health System's approach. Dr. Mazur is board certified by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery and has fellowship training and subspecialty certification in hand surgery. He treats hand and upper extremity conditions and injuries from children whose fingers were crushed indoors to adults suffering with carpal tunnel syndrome. Dr. Mazur focuses on minimally invasive treatments that offer the best possible results. His goal is to return his patients to their livelihoods as quickly and as safely as possible. New Jersey Monthly Magazine has named Dr. Mazur one of New Jersey's top docs each year from 2012 to 2017. He was elected to serve as the president of the Morris County Medical Society in 2006 through 2007 and as Morristown Medical Center's medical staff president President from 2014 to 2015. Morristown Medical Center's orthopedic program is ranked one of the top 50 orthopedic surgery programs in the country by U.S. News and World Report and one of the top 100 programs by Becker's Healthcare. Dr. Mazur, it's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to you to begin today's webinar. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. So I'd just like to start by introducing you to uh, Atlantic Health System. Uh, we're two and a half billion dollar health system. We're located in northern New Jersey. So we're about halfway between New York City and the Pennsylvania border. We have over 1,600 licensed beds, and we're spread over a five hospital system, plus a children's hospital called Goryev. We serve a primary population of just under two million. Our system also includes Atlantic Rehabilitation, Atlantic Home Care and Hospice, uh, and we are part of the, uh, we, we have the Atlantic Accountable Care Organization, as well as the Optimus uh, Atlantic, uh, Accountable Care Organization, uh, both nationally recognized and, and somewhat profitable um, uh, ACOs. We have more than 600 community-based healthcare providers through our Atlantic Medical Group. We're the largest multi-specialty practice in New Jersey. Uh, we've, we're well managed. We have a good cash flow, good balance sheet and our debt is low, so we're in a pretty good position. You can see some pictures of our beautiful hospitals up there. Here's the background for this. Uh, hip and knee replacements are the most common inpatient surgery for Medicare beneficiaries. And the recovery can take quite a while and uh, includes um, rehab costs. So in 2014, there were more than 400,000 procedures, uh, costing more than $7 billion just for the hospitalizations. Despite the high volume of the surgeries, the quality and cost of care for these hip and knee replacement surgeries really varies greatly amongst the providers. For example, the rate of complications such as infections or implant failures after surgery can be more than three times higher at some facilities than others. These complications also increase the chance that a patient may be readmitted to the hospital. It's been shown that the average Medicare expenditure for surgery, hospitalization, and the recovery can really vary from a low of about $16,500 to about $33,000 across a variety of geographic areas. So CMS and some payers have made it clear that they're gonna be shifting some of the risk to the providers. So the challenge is, how do we manage the costs when those costs are not just preventative? Uh, we have to be able to control our costs for the high cost procedures. We need to maintain the good relationships that we have with our physicians. Remember, no physicians means no patients for our system. 
So the, the goal is not to shift the cost to the physicians, but to create partnerships with our physicians uh, to truly align with the organization. And that's what we've uh, tried to do and, and uh, been somewhat successful with it. I like this slide because this kind of gives you CJR in a nutshell, and I, and I just like to go over what the program involves. Uh, you know, like any good game, if we understand the rules, we can thrive at it. It works for Monopoly, it works for CJR. So this is a five-year program. Uh, it began April 1st of 2016, and it goes through to the end of 2020. It's mandatory for those hospitals that were initially selected, and so they had 67 what are called medical service areas, and all of the hospitals, with certain exceptions for rural and very, very small hospitals, uh, were included, and it's mandatory for them. They gave exclusions to those hospitals that were already in BPCI, that's the Bundled Payment Care Initiative Program. But for everybody else, this was mandatory. Now, since then, there's been some new legislation. They've actually cut the mandatory medical service areas about in half. Uh, so for some of the hospitals, it no longer became mandatory. For us and the other 34 in our medical service areas, it remained mandatory. So it's still mandatory for us, although frankly, we're very glad to have it. It's really helped us, uh, as you'll see. The beneficiaries only include Medicare patients, and that's Medicare fee-for-service patients. And it includes those in DRGs 469 and 470. And I just want to explain that. So a DRG 469 and 470 is any lower extremity joint replacement procedure. This includes our elective patients who have a total knee replacement or a total hip replacement, but it also includes patients with hip fractures that result in what's called a partial joint replacement or a hemiarthroplasty. Okay, so it's a mix of elective patients uh, with a smaller percentage being uh, emergency patients. The difference between 469 and 470 is simply 470 is, is, are those patients without a major comorbidity or complication, and 469 is those patients with a major comorbidity or complication. So we would expect the spend to be somewhat higher on those with the major comorbidity or complication, and that's the DRG 469. We'll show that in a few moments. CMS has defined the episode. So the episode starts when the patient enters the hospital. It includes their surgical procedure. It includes everything that happens in the hospital after that procedure. And then it includes 90 days of care after discharge, with very few exceptions. Exceptions for things like cancer care, um, transplant, things like that. So there's responsibility for this entire episode. Then what CMS did is they set a target price. So in the beginning of this program in 2016, they looked back at data from 2012 through 2014, okay, and they aggregated that, and they came up with a target price for each of these episodes, and I'll go through the four of them with you in a moment. Then what they did is they said, okay, we're going to take 3% off the top. So not only do you have to beat your target price, but you got to beat 3% below your target price. And they've said, if you reach certain quality metrics, we're not going to quite penalize you 3%. We'll either penalize you 2% or 1.5% off the top. So the quality metrics uh, really become important here. All of the risk is on the hospital. So the physicians who perform the surgeries get their regular fee-for-service Medicare. The therapists who treat the patients get their regular fee-for-service. And the rehab hospital, either an acute rehab facility or a subacute nursing facility, they get their usual fee for service from the hospital. All of the risk is on the hospital itself. And they don't do it by hospital system. We're a five hospital system. Each individual hospital is responsible. And I'll show you in a moment how that goes. So reconciliation payments can really go either way. Okay. So if we spend below our targets and reach certain quality metrics, which I'll show you in a moment, if we spend below, then there's extra money, and CMS will share some of that money with us in what's called a reconciliation payment. But if we spend over the target, we would owe CMS money. So this is just a summary, again, of the bundle and the episode. So the episode starts when the patient comes in. Okay, It includes what happens in the hospital. It includes what happens after the patient leaves the hospital, whether that's the patient going home, to an inpatient rehab facility or to a subacute nursing facility, and it includes any readmission during that 90 days. Okay, it's the total spend during that time. So that defines the episode, and it's important to understand that. They break it down. So a patient who had a hip fracture, for example, would be expected to probably be more expensive than one who has an elective joint arthroplasty. Okay, so they break it down into these four bundles. The DRG 469, again, that's the more complicated patients, both 
with and without fracture, and the DRG-470, okay, that's the less complicated patients, both with and without fracture. So in 2016, which is when the program started, and in 2016, it was only nine months, because remember, the program started April 1st, they set a stop gain limit of 5%. So if, for example, our bundle came in at a target price of $28,000, okay, and we spent significantly less than that, okay, 5% of that would be about $1,400, we could get up to $1,400 for each one of those cases in year one. And in year one, since they knew everybody was getting started, uh, it, was, it was very nice, they said, there's no loss. If you spend over the target in year one, don't worry about it, you're not gonna owe us any money, okay? That has changed in year two. So in year two, we can still get that 5% gain on each case, okay? But if we spent more than our target, we would owe CMS up to 5%. We're now in 2018, so we're now in a 10% potential gain or a 10% potential loss. And it will double again next year. So in 2019 and 2020, it will be at 20%. So we've talked about the target for spend. Let me just explain how the quality part works. Again, you've got, we've got to understand the rules so we can see how to play the game. So for the quality part, half of our score is based on risk standardized complication rate. Okay, that's readmissions tied to certain diagnoses during that 90-day no, period, okay? 40% of our score is based on HCAPs, that's patient experience, okay? And it's not just the HCAPs on the orthopedic floors or amongst the orthopedic patients, it's hospital-wide HCAPs. So this program really forces us to work throughout the hospital. And I'm gonna repeat this theme a number of times, but I'm really thrilled that we were in the mandatory bundle because it gave us the kickstart we needed and I don't know that we would have done it otherwise. There have been voluntary bundles before this, but this forced us to work as a system and with our physicians. And so the mandatory part of this was nice. They're going forward with other voluntary models going forward, but, um, but for us, it, it really was helpful. So that's 90% of our quality score. The last 10% of our quality score is whether or not we submit what are called pros or patient reported outcomes, okay? Initially, that's just on the pre-op patients starting in year two and going forward, so where we are now. It also includes patient reported outcomes after surgery, okay? Right now, it's voluntary, okay? It may or may not become mandatory in years four and five, but regardless, we get points for it and it goes towards our quality score. So, if we spend below our target price and we meet certain quality standards, we'll get money. If we spend above our target price, we'll owe money. The amount of the discount is directly affected by that quality score. And CMS has divided those quality scores into excellent, good, acceptable, or below acceptable. And if we get a below acceptable quality score, it doesn't matter how much money we've saved, CMS won't share it with us because they feel that we have below acceptable quality. And of course, what we call quality and CMS calls quality may, aren't always exactly the same thing, but CMS has laid it out based on the metrics that I just spoke about on the last slide to define for us exactly what they call quality. And if we get money, again, that, sh that discount is a little lower. So if we have an excellent quality score, we'll get more money than if we only have a good or an acceptable quality score. So that defines the reconciliation payment and the finance part, which of course is critical to all of our well-being. Remember, we're a five hospital system. Turns out only four of our hospitals are in the medical service area that include, uh, that are included in the CJR program. So Hackettstown, our smallest hospital is not, and of course our children's hospital is not. We're not doing total joint replacements on our kids. So these four hospitals are in, and you can see there's pretty broad vi variation. So our largest hospital is Morristown Medical Center, and these numbers were based on the targets that CMS gave us. So if you recall, the, the, tar the episode spend was defined based on information from 2012 through 2014. So an important part of this program is CMS gave us our data. They gave us our data so that we could look at it, see where our opportunities were, and learn from it. Okay, so that's another big advantage of this program. So Morristown is our largest hospital. We had over 1,000 CJR cases a year. Down the Newton, which is our smallest hospital, where we have just about 100 cases a year. And we have 40 different surgeons working at Morristown, down to about four in Newton, and actually some of the Newton surgeons have left to 
come to Morristown. So that number's gotten even smaller. So there's quite a bit of variability here. So we realized that we could really uh, learn from our, our biggest and, and best player, and that's Morristown Medical Center. Uh, as was noted in the introduction, we are a top 50 uh, U.S. News and World Report hospital. We're a high-performing hospital for total knee and total hip replacement. Uh, we also have disease-specific certification uh, from the Joint Commission for total hip and total knee. We're getting ready for that next month. We're all excited for that. Uh, we've had that for, uh, for about eight years. And we've also had um, accreditation for our spine program, but we're not here to talk about that today. Uh, this is what our system is, just at a glance. So we did about 1,700 CJR surgeries a year. When you count all total joint, uh, remember, CJR is just the Medicare patients. Uh, so when you count all total joints, it's 4,000. That also includes the bilaterals and the revisions. CJR does not include bilaterals or revisions. Okay. We have about 6,000 inpatient cases a year, and if you add the outpatient, we're up to about 12,000. This was a challenge for us because of the makeup of our staff. You know, it's not like we have one group of surgeons that get together on a regular basis and say, well, we're gonna do it this way and, and we're gonna improve. Uh, we had 84 CJR surgeons across the system. And uh, yeah, some of them were employed by the hospital, two. So two of the 84 were employed by the hospital. The other 82 are what we call self-employed. Um, and uh, it, it is a bit like herding cats and it's really critical to get uh, the buy-in. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we uh, went about that. Uh, if you look at our total cases performed in CJR, fewer than 3% of those were performed by these physicians who were employed by the system. So we, we had a bit of a challenge. So in year one, we put together a steering committee and work groups. We analyzed our baseline data, and we wanted to come up with some key summary recommendations, and we developed our goals and our initiatives, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about each of those. So this is what our steering committee looks like. Um, I can't stress enough the importance of senior leadership. Um, you know, we can put these programs together, but if we're not supported from the very, very top, uh, it doesn't happen. We need the resources and we need the buy-in. So we, we report directly to CJR leadership. I'm the physician lead. Uh, we have an administrative lead uh, and we also have a steering committee. And that steering committee initially would meet every couple of weeks. We're now meeting probably every two or three months. Uh, and we'd, we'd oversee the project. Uh, and then we have work groups. So what you see here are the initial work groups that were put in place to get this program off the ground, okay? And we started this steering committee back around October of 2015. Remember, the bundle started in uh, April of 2016. So the initial focus of the committee was to develop a standardized, system-wide, complete care redesign for those two DRGs, 469 and 470, so we could decrease our spending and maintain our quality. Kind of obvious after we understand the rules. So we had to maintain that high quality of care and we had to work with our surgeons. So one thing that CMS did that made this really, really a little bit easier and really great was it wrote in the rules that we can gain share with our surgeons. So we didn't have to worry about stark violations, we could gain share directly with our surgeons as long as the surgeons were contributing to quality, okay? And I'll show you a little bit later on just how we did that and how we tied those metrics. But the rules of the game were written in there that allowed us to do that, and that was key. We were able to develop a preferred post-acute uh, network. So what I mean by post-acute network is we worked with our inpatient rehab facilities and our subacute nursing facilities okay, to make sure that they could take care of our patients to give us the quality we need and work with us on the spend. And I'm going to show you that in a, in a few minutes, All right? We had to develop a roadmap for our patients through their procedure and that 90-day post-op. We had to find a way that we could work with them, not just in the hospital, okay? And of course, we had to determine our cost efficiencies. So these were our key recommendations uh, at the beginning. We had to learn from our leader, and I'll show you that in a moment. We had to look at our SNFs. Okay, and our inpatient rehab and see what we could do to, to improve not only the quality, but also the spend. We had to make sure we could engage our physicians and we had to look at the care pathways. So our model year one goal, and you'll see in a few moments why this is important, and, and most people that are involved with CJR very much understand why it's important, but I do wanna go over it, is we wanna increase discharge disposition to home. It's not necessary for every patient to go to a SNF or an inpatient rehab facility. And we need to work to decrease the length of stay when they do go, okay? We have patients with a broad variety of lengths of stay at these facilities, and there's guidelines out there 
uh, that set appropriate targets. And so we needed to find a way to work with our subacute providers to make sure that those targets were met. So our year one initiatives uh, would, would, were really focused on, on these things. So we wanted to make sure we could standardize our order sets. We wanted to try and standardize care guidelines. And we wanted to standardize our patient education. Okay, so on the order set side, we have to work with our physicians, okay? They're the experts. Remember, I'm a hand surgeon, okay? We're work, this is a total joint project, okay? So we need the total joint surgeons who were involved to come together to work on their, on their processes, and, and we were able to accomplish that. We needed physician leadership from each site. Remember, we have four different hospitals going on. And what we realized, too, is if we're going to improve care, well, we're not going to improve care for four of our five hospitals. We're going to improve care for all five of our hospitals. So we needed to make sure we got people from each of those hospitals in uh, for anything we needed to standardize. And we would work with physician leaders at each site that would then go back to their departments, get the input, provide the information. Okay, we realized that we had to work with them to collect and provide uh, our navigators, and I'll go into that function in a few moments, uh, with tools to help us decide which patients are likely to need to go to which post-acute setting. And we needed them to help us collect those patient-reported outcomes that were gonna be an important part of our quality score. Okay, we were able to standardize things such as pain management, antibiotics, weight-based dosing, but the biggest change was that preferred discharge disposition to home. The other thing we did that's really important is standardizing patient education. So we've created classes uh, throughout the system in a standardized way, and I'll talk about that. Uh, we included our physicians, our office staff, our nursing, everybody as part of the team in developing this education, okay? What we did is put it, something into place so that if a patient is having their surgery, say, at Overlook, but lives closer to Morristown, they could come to Morristown for their class, and it would be exactly the same as what they'd get at Overlook. Okay, we also have more classes at Morristown. It's a bigger facility. So every day we have a class at Morristown at Overlook or Chilton, for example, it might be once or twice a week. So these were our challenges and these are the things that we focused on uh, in year one. What we realized we had to do is we had to understand where our data was. And this is where the partner with uh, Change Healthcare really came in and the uh, Analytics Explorer uh, solution. Uh, we had to develop some custom analytics, and, and, and we worked directly with uh, Change Healthcare on putting this together so that it would meet the needs that, that we found, in addition to using their expertise as to what might be best um, from a, from a uh, global standpoint. We had to develop scorecards that had to do with information regarding our surgeons, our hospitals, where we were sending our patients after surgery, whether that was home, whether without home care, or to our skilled nursing partners, okay, and the variety of home care agencies that are out there. We had a look at the opportunity by DRG and by fracture status, because remember, they're separate bundles for each of them. And we had to focus on reducing variation and trying to optimize that post-acute utilization. We wanted to make sure we had a balanced set of metrics with patient satisfaction, with complication rates, uh, readmission reporting, et cetera, so that we could really drill down. And this is kind of what the scorecard looks like, and, and, and it's an eye test, and, and, and you know, we're not looking for you to, to read each of these, but what you can see is that we've got each of those bundles stratified, and this we can do by physician. So an individual physician, we could show them where their spend is, is it in the hospital, is it on the post-acute side, where does that come in compared to the peers? Okay, everybody's interested in that. Orthopedic surgeons are very, very competitive and they wanna be the best. So if they're doing something that's a higher cost and their neighbors are doing something that's a lower cost and the outcomes are just as good, they will try to mirror that, okay? They'll get up and say, well, my way is best and my patients are sicker. But when you give them the data and can show them compared to their peers, okay, it really helps drive behavior. And by the way, when you can gain share to it, it drives behavior even further. Okay, so we, we gave them that information. We gave them the risk adjusted complication rate, their functional outcome documentation. We gave them whether their patients are going to class. Okay, I remember one meeting I came, I, I presented at, I showed the big slide and one of the guys says, well, how come I'm not getting any points on this? And the answer was, well, because your patients aren't going to class. He says, well, I provide the same education in my office. We said, well, you know, we've put together a standardized program and if you wanna get those gain share points, you need your patients to come to class. Oh, okay, his numbers shot right up. 
So these individual scorecards were really key. Okay, so this is what we noticed when we started. Okay, and this again is, is from Analytics Explorer, and we blurred out the surgeons' names, but look at the episodes there. So we had surgeons over that three year period that ate 800, we had a surgeon with 811 episodes. This is a busy, busy guy. And, and by the way, all of these are, are guys, so I'm gonna, I, I may use that term. Okay, so our busiest surgeon with 811 episodes, go over to the area where it's red. Okay, if you look, we have 41% of his patients went to a subacute nursing facility and 36% went to inpatient rehab. Okay, so over 75% of his patients were going to a post acute facility. Surgeon number two, with 680 episodes, over half of his patients were going home. Okay, big disparity there, and their complication rates weren't terribly different. Okay, these guys happened to be partners. Okay, they were partners in a big group. Okay, now, the literature supports that a patient who goes home has a less likelihood of a complication than a patient who goes to a facility. So not only is there a save in money, but you're likely to have fewer complications. Okay, and we're gonna, and we verified that with our internal data, which I'll show you in a few moments. So what we were able to do is say, look, we had this busy surgeon who's sending most of their patients home, doing very well, and this was a way, this was a physician champion for us, so we could really model this behavior. And if we could get all that red turned into green, we realized we'd have the financial part of this pretty much solved, okay? And we'd likely help with our, on our complication side. So with the help of this data, we decided to gain share on these four metrics. The number one, most important of these, was whether we could take our DRG 470 without fracture patient. Remember, that's the one without a major comorbidity or complication, okay, without a fracture. So these are theoretically healthy elective patients, okay, that ought to be able to go home. So the greatest gain share was what was the number of patients they could get to go home. And we certain, set certain thresholds, and depending on whether you met a certain threshold, you get a certain number of points, if you would. Okay. The second thing we did is we said, your complications are very important. Okay. They're important for two reasons. Number one, we hate complications. Complications are problems. It means a patient's having a problem. So we hate that to begin with. Okay. Then it goes to our quality score. And by the way, the complication costs money. So it hits our spend. So that was critically important. Okay. The reason that the discharge to home was raised even higher is because that's clearly something that's within the control of the surgeon to influence that. The surgeon can influence the complication rate also, but there's many more factors involved. So we wanted to give them the highest points to something that was A, very important, and B, something that they could have significant influence on. Because nobody wants to be scored on something that you can't control, okay? They could also control whether their patients went to class. And when I say control, it usually means the surgeon telling the patient, it's important that you go to class. Because if the surgeon doesn't think it's important and doesn't convey the message that it's important, the patient's not gonna go to class. And if the surgeon thinks that it is important and conveys that message appropriately, that patient will. So all of this starts in the surgeon's offices, which is why the gain sharing really is so helpful. And lastly, whether they could help us complete our uh, patient reported outcomes. And frankly, we put a team in place to assist them with that. And we'll, and we'll show you that going forward. So the key objectives were developed for the work group. And what we realized was that they were really focusing on the inpatient side. But remember, 90 days of this, is post-acute care. So we realized we needed a group of people that would follow those patients after discharge. So we created another work group here called the Navigator Work Group. And we hired a new person, okay? And that's the only person that we really hired that was new in this whole system, okay? And that's Mina Lefevre. She's our system central navigator. And to say she's fabulous is just an understatement. But um, she is all over managing the out uh, the what happens after the patient is discharged. And I'll go through in a little bit as to exactly what they do. And then we took orthopedic nurses from each of our sites. And this shows the four that are in the CJR plan, but we did include Hackettstown as well. It's just not on the slide because they're not in CJR. And we have a site navigator at each site that manages these patients. Because remember, 90 days of this is after the patient's left the hospital. So these navigators, their role 
is to work with the patients in the hospital, but their main function is to connect with those patients after they've left the hospital during that 90 days. So this is the slide that we showed earlier. Okay, and this again just shows that opportunity. So about 40% of our costs was on the inpatient side. The physician fees were a small part of it. A lot of it's implant costs, things like that, and the cost of the hospitalization. But when we looked at the data that was provided to us with the analytic system, what we realized was that there was really not a lot of variation here, okay? So low variation, and there wasn't a lot of savings opportunities, okay? Where the high variation was, was really on the post-acute side, okay? And again, the, the Explorer really showed that to us as we saw in that previous slide. Back to discharge to home for a moment. Um, the spend part is obvious. Uh, you, you're gonna spend a lot less money if a patient goes home, even with home care, uh, than if they go to a facility. Um, but the readmission rate is also significantly different. So there's many published studies showing that patients who are discharged home have lower readmission rates. This is with our own data, okay? So with our own data, the discharge, the, I'm sorry, the readmission rate from a patient who's discharged to a facility was more than twice as high as a patient who is discharged to home, 9.8% versus 4.2%. Now, the argument comes in, well, of course that's the case. The sicker patients go to rehab. If they weren't sicker, they wouldn't need to go to rehab, okay? Well, that's not so true. When we standardize it and we look at those with two or fewer chronic conditions, it's not twice as high, but it's significantly higher. The readmission rate from a facility was 6.5% versus the readmission rate from those that went home that was 3.6%. So it's been shown in, in multiple studies, and we were able to verify it with our own data, which is really helpful to be able to show our surgeons. Then the question was, can we determine before surgery which patients are likely to go home versus which patients are likely to go to a facility? And can we influence that? Can we take a patient who otherwise might have had to be discharged to a facility, influence it in such a way that they can now be discharged to home? So this tool is not something we created. This had been published. Old Meadow had published this. Okay, But our therapists were all over it. Okay, and they realized that this was a useful tool. So what this tool does is it predicts whether a patient will go home or to a facility. And it looks at these risk factors that you can see here, age, how far the patient can walk, whether they have uh, community supports. But the number one influencer of whether a patient can go home or to a facility was, do they have somebody at home to help them after surgery? Okay, that was the biggest determinant as to whether a patient went home or not. And so this would allow us to influence it. If we saw that they got a certain score where they're likely to go to a facility, okay, that's one thing. If they were in an intermediate score, we looked at it and said, could we influence that, okay? And I'm gonna show you in a few moments how we divided this up between our central navigator and our site navigators. But basically, if we could help that patient identify somebody that could help them at home, we were much more likely to be able to get them to go home than to a facility, okay? So multiple fronts on this, educating our surgeons, okay? Having our surgeons educate our patients and explain to them that yes, it's okay, that, you can, that you'll be able to go home and having the data to show that it's likely. And we use something else called the KU tool. Um, and a KU tool is something that would give our third, it was developed, it's KU because it's called Kansas University, uh, developed it. And what that did was, was measures how a patient's doing in the hospital, how far they walk, whether they can do stairs, and they get a score. And if they score it over a certain threshold, those patients are likely to be able to be discharged home without difficulty. And what it does is it gives the surgeon the confidence to know that their patient can go home, which is the right place. And it gives the patients the confidence that they say, oh, I scored well. People like me do well in this circumstance. The RAP tool hits those things. The RAP tool does not hit things like obesity and COPD and diabetes, some of these risk factors that we're gonna get to a little bit later in what we're doing now. So this is the RAPT, R-A-P-T, that's the Readmission Assessment and Prediction Tool. Later, we're gonna talk about the RRAP, which is the Readmission Risk Assessment Tool, and that's the RAP. And the RAPT and the RAT kind of sound similar, 
uh, but they're different. The RAPT helps us predict where a patient's likely to go. The RAT, which we'll talk about later, is going to predict whether a patient's likely to be readmitted, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Okay, this is our navigators. So our central navigator is going to follow all of our high-risk patients. Anybody who scored over nine, okay? The intermediate patients and the low risk, and the patients who are low likelihood to go to a facility, okay, are gonna be scored by the site navigators, okay? So when their score is really low, okay, and they're likely to be discharged to a post-acute facility, our central navigator will, will take care of them, and that's MENA. So MENA will follow every patient that's likely to go to a facility, and if the patient does go to a facility, whether they were likely to or not, but they actually go to a facility, MENA will follow them. And MENA will, follow, will keep in touch with each of the post-acute facilities to make sure that they're following the right track. And I'll show you that on the next slide. And the site navigators will support the central navigator, okay? They'll handle all of the low-risk patients, okay? So this slide just shows a little bit what each does. So you can see that at the top, the site navigator has regular phone calls with those patients after discharge. So they want to make sure the patients understand their medications. They want to see if there's any problems that are developing. Okay, much better to deal with a developing problem than a problem that's already fully cooked. So the site navigators will call their patients at these various intervals. The central navigator, okay, the ones that are high risk, will call their patients before surgery. See if we can help get them a coach. Can we work with them? Can we turn them into a lower risk patient? If the patient actually goes to a facility, okay, the central navigator, Mina, she'll speak to that facility three times a week. How's our patient doing? Are they on track with their goals? Are they likely to go home in the time frame that we all expect? Are there any problems that we need to address? Okay, and then she also follows them after surgery. So sometimes we get her a little bit of help from the site navigators. So where did all of this work get us in year one? Well, remember all the red we had uh, over here? We still have a little bit of red, but our high performers, okay, and the reason they see the episodes lower is because this is only one year of episode. The previous was three years of, of episodes, and it's not even one year. It's really six months because the, the episode, remember, ran from April 1st through December 30th, but it only counted in that year if they were discharged at, uh, by the end of the episode. So remember, the episode run out is 90 days. So they had to, their procedure had to be done between April 1st, really, and September 1st. So this is really six months of data in year one. Year two would be a full year of data. But look how much green we have, okay? So, so we've really shifted the behavior in our physicians to discharge home, okay? Tremendous success with this. And again, you couldn't do this without the analytics to see where your trouble was beforehand. So how'd Mina do with our length of stay at the subacute facilities? So remember, Far fewer of our patients are actually going to a subacute facility now, okay, because we've gotten much more discharge to home. And those that are going to a subacute facility are staying significantly shorter period of time, okay? So you can see we were up around 20 days. Now we're down around 12, 13 days, okay? And this is what this means in dollars, okay? So it costs about $600 a day, and we can cut off about six or seven days. All right, we've saved almost $4,000 an episode. Well, there's our, there's the max that we can possibly get in years one and two right there, okay? Just on savings on patients that actually go to a SNF, not counting the fact that we've gotten far fewer patients uh, to go to a SNF to begin with. So in year one, our goal was to increase discharge disposition to home, and we beat that goal by 117%. Okay, it was also to decrease the length of stay for a patient that's going to a post-acute facility, and we decreased that by 52%. How'd we do in dollars? Pretty well. Um, amongst the, all the hospitals in the country that got a reconciliation payment, we got the second highest dollar amount at Morristown, okay? Um, HSS got number one, all right? We were number two. And that's a function of our high volume, our significant savings, and our excellent quality score that you see on the bottom there. We also had an excellent quality score at Newton, okay, and they got over $80,000, and we had a good quality score at Chilton, and they got almost $100,000. Now, we got something that we're not so proud of over here on the far right. Um, Overlook, they would have gotten $240,000. Money got left on the table. Why? Because it was below acceptable quality score. 
Okay, and we're doing quite a bit of work on seeing what we can do to improve that. Remember, that's a function of hospital-wide age caps, risk standardized complication rate, and the PRO submission, but every hospital got the PRO submission. But that's not enough to get you out of the basement on the quality score. So unfortunately, we did leave some money on the table, and uh, we, we too can improve. So in year two, we've got our work groups further developed. Okay, we used our year one as baseline, and we had to focus our shift to uh, reducing readmissions. Readmissions, remember, hurt us in two ways. One is um, if it directly goes to that quality score, and number two is there's a significant decrease in cost, which I'll show you in a few moments. Okay, so in year two, we changed out some of our work groups. Their work had been done in getting us ready, and we're gonna focus on readmission. So we introduced a pre-admission work group, how can we optimize patients before surgery, an index admission work group, what can we do during that hospitalization? And most importantly, a case analysis work group that looks at every readmission for every joint patient throughout the hospital, not just the Medicare, not just the singles. So they look at the bilaterals, anybody who gets readmitted, pardon me, anybody who gets readmitted and what can we learn from that? And if we learn something, can we give that to the appropriate work group, for example, the pre-admission work group to change processes to decrease the likelihood of readmissions, okay? Analytics helps us here too. We realize that there are certain facilities that had higher likelihood of readmissions than others, gives us some areas to focus on. And this was our readmissions by month. The reason that some of this is blank is because we don't have that data from CMS. Remember, we had 2012 to 2014, and then we get new data starting in 2016. But it's sawtooth, and although it's going in the right direction, we needed to go in the right direction a bit more quickly. We've talked about the quality score. This is the spend part. For a DRG 469, our, our higher complication patients, that's a $50,000 difference whether that patient gets readmitted or not. It costs us $50,000 more to take care of that patient if they get readmitted. Okay, our 470 patients, that's without major comorbidity or complication, more than $20,000 more per patient. So the cost here is tremendously different. We did a deep dive amongst our existing patients. We realized that the uh, top correlations with readmission is weight, ASA score, and existing cardiac conditions. Patient with a BMI of 30 to 40 was one and a half times more likely to be readmitted, and a patient with a BMI over 40 was 2.1 times more likely to be readmitted. The patient had AFib, they were 2.4 times as likely to be readmitted, and if they had heart failure, they were more than four times as likely to be readmitted. So we use that, and we're gonna use the RRAT tool, which I'll talk to you about on the last slide. So between year two and year one, we focused again on readmissions. We're now collecting post-op uh, patient reported outcomes as well. We've seen tremendous improvement in our discharge to home. Okay, we started off around the 20s. Okay, as a system now, we're up above 80%, and frankly, at Morristown, we're getting up to 90%. Okay, so throughout the system, we've done tremendously on discharge to home. Here it is by hospital. Morristown started out in the 30s. Again, they're up above the 80s now, but look, some of our hospitals had zeros. They weren't sending anybody home, okay? And now they are, okay? The fact that some of them saw a gain share really, really helped. So I remember speaking to one surgeon who said to me after, when, when he got his check, you mean I really do get money out of this? His, re, his discharge to home went up tremendously right after that. Really makes a big difference when we can share our, our, our savings. This is how we did it as a system. So you can see, again, three of our four hospitals uh, got reconciliation payments. You have our estimates there for year two. We don't actually get a final reconciliation report until the end of May, so that's an internal estimate. Uh, but we hope to get about $1.8 million at Morristown. Overlook's on the fence. I don't know that we're going to get that quality score. We're, we're getting closer, but our current estimate is we will probably just miss the mark. And I can't tell you we've got a lot going on to try to improve that. I'll talk about that a little bit, but not too much. And um, the bottom line is we expect to get more than $2 million uh, in year two, which again, we're gonna share with our surgeons. So what are we doing going forward? Well, we've talked a little bit about the RRAT tool, the readmission risk assessment tool to help us optimize our patients. That takes into account factors such as smoking, obesity, uh, diabetes, okay, it scores them. And what we're doing is we're giving this information to our surgeons prior to surgery. So if their patient is high risk, we're now giving them documentation as to what those high risk areas are, and we're giving them the tools to optimize those patients. So we're not just saying your patient is diabetic, 
and not, not well controlled. We're saying, well, your patient's diabetic and they're not well controlled. And here's the number that you want to have your patient call so that they can see the appropriate specialist to get that patient in better control. The goal is not to not operate on the patients. We want to operate on the patients. We're here to help patients, okay? But we want to optimize them before surgery, okay? So that we can decrease our readmission risk, decrease our complications, and make it safer and healthier for our patients. We've also par partnered with Mobile Integrated Health, you see here on the top right. So remember, our CJR nurses reach out to each of our patients at regular intervals, okay? But sometimes a patient has a problem and it's not during one of those intervals. So we've created a 24 seven hotline where the patient will call. If it's during regular hours, they'll reach their navigator who they know. If it's outside of regular hours, it'll go to Mobile Integrated Health, man 24 seven. Okay, they'll, they have an algorithm, they'll speak to the patient. If they need to have the patient be evaluated, Mobile Integrated Health will go out to the patient's home and evaluate the patient. If they can handle it there, that's fine. They speak to the physician, okay, they put their heads together and if the patient needs to come in, they bring the patient in. What this also does is make sure that patient gets in back to our physicians. So we do a lot of joint surgeries in patients who don't live in our catchment area. Okay, and if they live an hour away down at the Jersey Shore and they have a problem, before this, they were going to their local emergency room where they'd get admitted for their cellulitis, okay? Now, if Mobile Integrated Health sees that patient, we bring them back to our facility where we realize, well, we can treat that cellulitis, we'll give them an antibiotic, we'll let them go home, we'll continue to monitor them, and we can keep it safe. If they've got a dislocation, we can reduce that. If they've got anemia, we can transfuse that, and we can get that patient home saving significant money, getting the patient back home, and by the way, helping our quality scores, okay? What we've also done is we've allowed physicians now to get a higher percentage of gain share if they're willing to share in the risk. And they're pretty willing to share in the risk because in our first couple of years, we haven't lost any money. Remember, even at Overlook, although we didn't have the quality score, we had significant savings, so we didn't owe any money. So there, the risk to the physicians is really pretty small and it just increases their buy-in. Um, just some last closing thoughts, some other outcomes. Uh, we've helped our, our hospital as a whole uh, by keeping patients from being readmitted. We've helped our throughput issues, okay? This has been a real halo effect. It's helped change be physician behavior. They realize that, that they're not working in an antagonistic relationship with administration. Some physicians, unfortunately, feel that way from time to time, but we're working together for, for gains that are gonna help all of us. It helps our quality, and by the way, we can share dollars, okay? And it's helped grow our market share. You know, we have physicians who would be doing cases at other hospitals who are more likely to do patients now at our hospitals here because we've had good outcomes and because they've gotten to share in their gain sharing. And my last comment is this is truly a team sport, okay? We can't do this without senior leadership being fully on board, without finance being fully on board, and without the analytics that give us that information to allow us to partner with what's really most important here, which is our surgeons who drive our patients to our facilities and take care of them. So I think I've used my time. Thank you very much, and I'm here for as many questions as you all like. Thank you, Dr. Mazur. Just a terrific presentation, organized, thoughtful, and real hands-on experience with what's working and what's not working. I've got a number of questions so far. Let me start with a couple um, audience questions. How do you adjust for social, economic, and behavioral factors when looking at cost? How do, how do you sort of look at those different things? Patients come from different societal backgrounds. Some of them have help at home, some don't. How do you assess that, or do you assess yeah. that? And, 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 and we're, you know, it's an important point that we've identified and haven't spent much, that we haven't give, dove deeply into yet. And the analytics piece will help us with that. So, so we're turning to that as something new to look at um, because you're right, there's different resources for those patients that are available. And so it would be very useful to stratify along that way. And we're also using our analytics in, in other new ways, like, like can we bundle our implants? You know, can we go to fewer vendors and save money on that side too? So there's a lot of opportunity there. And, and, and although we've identified that as one to work on, we haven't done a deep dive on it yet. Let me ask you a question about the analytics, because besides the people skills and the leadership, a key part of everything that you do with this is analytics driven and having the data to make good decisions. How did you decide on or get to the point of adopting 
Analytics Explorer. What drove you to end up with that particular application or or, or product for use for this versus something else? Sure, and 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 again, I'm I'm the physician lead, and I will tell you that the great majority of work on that was really done by our administrative team, and uh, Lauren Johnson is is currently the coordinator for that, and she and and, and her team really spent a lot of time evaluating a variety of products. So they sat in on all the webinars. I got to one or two, but I got to tell you, they did the Omens work on this and, and learned what the different products were that were out there. And they settled on this one because they could work together with them. And what this product, what, what this company was willing to do was say, we want this product to work for you. We think we know what's good and we think we know what you want to know, but we realize that you're an individual and you're going to look for things that are important to your docs that the guy down the street may not. And so what this company was willing to do was work with us to develop this product. So we would have meetings with them where they would show us and say, is this the scorecard you're looking for? Do you think your surgeons would respond the way we're showing this? Okay. And sometimes we'd say yes. And sometimes we'd say, no, you're, you're not catching what's important to the doc. And then they were responsive to that. So that's really what drove us to this particular product. Because of the the sort of newness of this whole experience, the, the risk contracting elements to it, the data use of it, how easy has it been to use the product to get up to speed on it? You know, just, just to give us a sense of it, because people talk about doing bundles and taking risk, but you know, without the support, it, it's really, you're really guesstimating. But then everybody's so busy, so ease of use is important. How has this been to get used, to get going on, to get working on? And are there other areas besides bundle joints that you think about using this kind of analytics explorer? So um, we, we've, I'm going to answer the second part of your question first. So we, we've used this in a couple of different areas. We've used it for adverse drug events, things like pay for performance, um, uh, our health grades, mortality, and complications. So we've, we've had a number of different areas uh, that use this. It's also the backdrop for our uh, ACO work. So our accountable care organizations, which are two of the largest and, and really uh, most profitable, have, have been using this. Um, those that, that do this on a regular basis uh, get into it uh, very easily. What I like is I can understand the reports, um, and, it, and it means something to me. It's not coming into, you know. <laughs> I, I, so my back, although I love math and uh, I was always a math geek, I, I'm a doc, and when I see these big Excel tables, they boggle my mind. And this brings it into a visual that I can see and that my docs can see, and it's meaningful. Gee, how come my blue bar is bigger than his blue bar? You know, what's in that blue bar? Okay, and, and so this allows us to do that. And the team that works with this on a regular basis is able to manipulate that data really very quickly to show those things. And that's, and that's been very helpful. Exclusion, inclusion criteria, a different subject for outpatient ambulatory surgery. How do you assess, I don't know if this is, obviously not new, new to what you do, but how do you put but, but a different edge on it with risk and so forth? How do you assess what candidates are eligible for outpatient ambulatory surgeries versus not? So, and, and that's, you know, and that's become such an important topic lately because, as you know, uh, CMS has taken uh, inpatient knees off of the um, the inpatient only list. So we do have patients uh, that are moving to the, um, that are getting done exactly the same way, but they're now classified uh, as outpatients. And that tends to be a patient population that's healthier, okay, generally younger, okay, and has fewer comorbidities. Um, and so we can use these tools to, uh, to help us decide which patients uh, might be most appropriate for that. But I have to say, we haven't done a lot of work on that yet to date. <laughs> Thank you. A number of other questions. How do you measure patient and family satisfaction with how people are going home and just the whole project? How do you sort of measure patient and family satisfaction? So the, the pros aren't satisfaction per se, they are functional. So our patient reported outcomes are much more functional. Our satisfaction is really 
through the standardized ways that's the press gainy and the and the h cap scores um and that we can tie back and uh sometimes it's difficult to do that to an individual physician or provider uh so it's a, a little bit more aggregate and we haven't done specific looking at you know we have we haven't for example asked the question of are your satisfaction scores higher uh to go home to or or to a facility intrinsically i would think that they'd be higher to a patient who goes home and is more comfortable um but it's not a question we've specifically asked you asked something in the last question too that i incompletely answered which was um wh where are we going next and and you know everybody knows that uh it's not everybody everybody on this call knows that um you know bundle payment uh, is, is just growing. And of course, they've got about 25 new metrics um, that uh, they're going to, 25 new bundles that they're going to be looking at. Probably uh, over half of those are in orthopedics, either in joint or in spine. And so we have signed up to be on the voluntary side on that now. Remember, this was mandatory. So we've signed up on the voluntary side. And we should be getting our data from CMS in May. And we have until August to choose which bundles we're going to go with. So this deep dive in the way of analytics is going to be critical to us making those decisions. Let me Sorry. make one, one yep. comment quickly. Is One, I love your directness as a presenter where you acknowledge, look, we haven't studied family satisfaction in the same way, but we have it more in aggregate at this point, but you've got some intrinsic thoughts on it. So I love the fact that you're willing to say, we've done this, we've not done this. Just terrific. And, and then the next follow-up question, Dr. Mazur, is what data is fed into Analytics Explorer? How, how does data get fed into it? How does that work, and what's fed into it? Oh, boy. You're, I, and I will tell you, you're getting a little out of my expertise. I know it's the CMS data, I don't, I, and I know it's provided by CMS. And, and what I'm told, okay, is it comes from CNS in complete gobbledygook that really needs to be translated in and it's a good thing we have smart people that know how to do that and <laughs> and, no, and they no, do absolutely. and i'm not sure exactly how it gets done but it comes from cms but, but it gets done and it comes out on the end of your end as the surgeon leading the program in a digestible usable format which is really i guess what counts to you that you guys can yep. make decisions with it and make analysis with it a couple other questions we've gotten and are the navigators nurses or another health discipline, or, or what's the typical background of the navigator? And then the second question that somebody had is, how does anesthesia play into this? Sure. So um, now you're on the clinical side, so thank you. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to, how do they do the data? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. But it's all, it's all helpful because so, people sort of see it from the perspective that you have of helping to lead the program on the physician side. Yeah. It, it's helpful to understand, hey, I don't do a deep dive into data. The other people do that, but at least in putting it into the system. And, and yeah, that's, that's okay. And I tell them how I need to see it. And they say, how's this? And I say, oh, yeah, that's good. Or no, I need to say it this way. And they're very good at that. And, and so, again, we've worked with this particular vendor, you know, uh, change on that particular program. Let me get to your next question, though. So all of our navigators are orthopedic nurses, okay? They are nurses who have worked on the orthopedic floor. They've got specialty and advanced training in orthopedics. Um, and, boy, do they work well as a team. So they... What they do is they have relationships with each of the surgeons at their facility. Remember, that's 40 docs at Morristown, okay? And some of the smaller facilities, it's much easier. So they know who the docs are. They know who the schedulers are in the office. They know who the nurses are that the docs work with so that they can get the information that they need, okay? And they're orthopedic nurses, so they understand the patient perspective, what's important to that patient. And med rec is a big piece of that. If the patient doesn't understand their medicines, they're much more likely to end up back in our hospital than if they do understand their medicines. So these are all nurses. Anesthesia um, is, is so important. Um, you know, they help us uh, from a risk stratification uh, sense in that, um, you know, is the patient appropriate for surgery? Do they need to be optimized? We have anesthesia not only on the steering committee, but at several of our work groups. So, for example, um, we put together a pain protocol for our hip fracture patients. Remember, you know, I spoke mostly about elective joints, but about 10, 15, 20 percent of this is hip fractures, depending on which hospital you're looking at. So we need to standardize that as well. And they've come up with, you know, some pain management protocols to really minimize opioid use 
uh, and decrease pain so a patient's able to go home and be functional, okay? And doesn't, you know, it's not that they're writhing in pain and they need to go on to the next facility. The other thing we've done, and it's not anesthesia per se, is we've realized that an extra half a day or day of length of stay that allows a patient to get a little bit more physical therapy and make them now a candidate for home is better than sending them to a subacute facility. So we always used to get so excited about length of stay. Oh, our length of stay is down to 2.2, and that's really great. But the bottom line is, if they need to stay another half a day so that the therapist can walk with them, so they can walk further, get a higher KU score, and be more confident that they can go home, that's much more important than whatever that half of day of hospitalization cost us, or even a full day. So I'm sorry, I answered one more than you asked. No, I think that's a great question. If, 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 if you'll indulge us, and if change will indulge us, I'd like to go for a couple more minutes just because we've, we, we've got several more questions, and we could hit sure. them quickly, I hope. Um, next question is, have you found if you have noncompliant patients within the 90 days, how do you mitigate for that? And I, I take it the questioner means you know, patients that aren't doing what you ask them to do. How do you sort of try and offset that or manage that? <laughs> Cajoling. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, we, and we do, we have patients who darn it, they're coming in and they're going to the rehab facility because their cousin Larry did, and that's just going to be the way that is. And, and it really is a team approach. So we don't get that, look, we don't get 100% of our patients home. 15 to 20% of our patients need to go to a facility, okay? But we do have patients that are fairly set in their ways or who are more of a challenge to manage. So we want to get a consistent message to that. So it's important that the discharge planner knows what the plan is. And the physical therapist knows what the plan is. Because if any one of these people tell that patient, just tell them you got to go to the rehab facility and you can go to the spa. Because you know, some of the patients, they think it's the spa. We've, we've, been, we've been torpedoed by people down in x-ray who say to the patient, oh, you're uncomfortable. They told you you're gonna go home, wow. You know, so you really gotta communicate that out. So when you have that difficult patient whose mind is kind of made up, that team approach where everybody has that same consistent message is so helpful. Your point, you can't force them to do anything. So the concept yeah. that you use, that you hit right out of the boat, which is cajoling them, is probably right on. And it's in a variety of different ways, but Thank you. Two more questions. Do you share any of the gain share dollars with the SNFs, with the skilled nursing facilities or the post to care providers? So um, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about that. The bottom line, by the way, I have a long answer to every one of your short questions. I tell my patients that too. So, um, so, so we don't share dollars with the subacutes. The way we work with the subacutes is we said, look, we have this tremendous volume of patients. We know you want to treat our patients and you do good care. So if you'll work with us and answer the phone calls from our navigator and work with us to maintain lengths of stay that are within guidelines, there's always going to be exceptions. That's fine. Patients don't do as well as you expect. That's fine. But if you're going to work with us on our patients, then you will see more of our patients. And you're right, we can't tell the patient where to go. But I, look, I'm a hand surgeon. Somebody comes to me and they need hand therapy. I say, yeah, you can go to hand therapy at XYZ place. But Kara, who's in the building next door, she knows my protocols. We work together as a team. If there's a problem, she knows how to reach me. I would suggest you go to Kara. You can go wherever you want. But I would suggest you go to Kara. And Kara is her real name, by the way. Um, and so we, we all have that opportunity. We do, however, gain share with our home health care. And we've set metrics for them where they've got to see the patient within a certain period of time, and they've got to provide certain services, and we have a gain share with the home health care. But we haven't had the need to do it with the SNPs. Another question. How important are the patient navigators? Can you attribute a bottom line to them or, or not really? That's a really good question. Um, and one of our research nurses is doing a project on it that we don't have the answers to yet. Because, you know, one of the issues is, look, you're paying these people to do these things. And how much does that cost? And how much do we do we save? And it becomes a math problem, right? So um, we don't know the answer to that. We are doing the research into it. Our sense is that it's that a, we're making more money out of, we're collecting more in reconciliation 
by the way, you got to compare that to the penalty we could be paying too, then we're actually paying these people to do this. But more importantly, what these navigators have done, other than get us these dollars, is it's given us a way systematically to improve care. So when our readmission rates were going up, and I'm thinking, oh my God, how am I going to affect this? I realized I had the right team in place. I had the team in place throughout the organization to address the issue. And any issue that's at all related to joints, whether it hits CJR or not, we use this team. Currently, we're using the team to decrease our morbidity and mortality rates for all hip fractures, not just the ones in the bundle, by getting patients to the OR more quickly. So yes, we're looking at the dollars. We think we save money on that, uh, but we don't know. But regardless, it's a fantastic uh, program. And for the most part, finance sees that. Let me do this, Dr. Mazur. I think we're going to wrap up I want to thank you for your presentation. It was just absolutely outstanding, just just really insightful. And, and I think the way that you're think through these things and can answer questions gives the audience members, I hope, real insights into how this works. I, I do want to thank Relay Health and Change Healthcare who sponsored the webinar and provide the analytics behind your program through Analytics Explorer. So, so thank you very much to, to Change and Relay Health. We really appreciate the chance to present this. I love the fact that the webinar was truly completely informational and just really, um, you know, thoughtful on your part. And I know, uh, you know, you, you put a lot of time and thought into this. So it's really appreciated, Dr. Mazur. So thank you very much. And thank you to Change Healthcare and Relay Health. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Scott. And we'll, we'll wrap up. Thank you, sir. We'll talk to you shortly.